to now look at the next sub-theory, neoclassical. There's not much, there's not much to go on neoclassical realism except for what I'm about to really emphasize. So you can extract a lot of the stuff from the textbook. The first and probably most important thing is that the philosophies of classical realism that we've talked about, Machiavelli, Thucydides, and Thomas Hobbes, are now kind of brought into the 20th century. Okay? The 20th century, which will witness two world wars, weapons of mass destruction, and warfare to a degree that people never thought imaginable. Now what does that do for us? It means that neoclassical realism is far more pessimistic than classical realism initially observed. It is also based on a response to the next theory that we'll be looking at, liberalism. Liberalism, for the sake of just moving the argument forward, is far more optimistic. Liberalism is, come on guys, let's give peace a chance. Come on guys, we can do better than that. And neoclassical realism is like, yeah! You want to know what that happened? Hitler, that's what happens. Okay? You give peace a chance, reality is dictated by what? The most insane person in the room. And guess who was that insane mofo? Hitler. Okay? Peace in our time, Chamberlain? What the fuck do you mean peace in our time? Okay? Czechoslovakia wasn't even invited to the conference that dissolved its own sovereignty. Dude, seriously, who are you trying to kick? Okay? And if you don't believe me on that, Morgenthau basically voiced the concerns of U.S. security well before Kissinger came in. Right? Kissinger was also a good neoclassical realist. Morgenthau was really the progenitor of Kissinger. Both of them were pessimistic, but wait until, <laughs> wait until you get to E.H. Carr. Wait until you read Carr right after the midterm. Carr's work on the 20-year crisis between World War I and World War II is basically the idea that collective security failed under Wilsonian liberalism. Okay? You can have all the best intentions out there. That's all fine and good. If there still are belligerent states in the arena, that necessitates you to be belligerent as well. We would like to change, but hey, the world is run by idiots and probably always will be. Okay? So neoclassical realism is kind of like a aha moment to some of the ideas of liberalism, which, by the way, all right, I'm not debunking liberalism before we get to it. Lots of important things that come out of the school of liberalism, but neoclassical realism is kind of saying, yeah, you know what, hippie, take a seat. Okay? And that's largely because Liberty and personal freedoms that liberalism so desperately wants can only come with security and power. I think I even mentioned this last time, but it's worth repeating again. Jack Nicholson's very famous You Can't Handle the Truth speech in A Few Good Men. Right? You want the freedom to say what you want to say? You want the rights to do what you feel that you should be entitled to do? You can't do that when you have no army. You can't do that when you don't have defensible borders. You build up a nice, thick wall. You can do whatever the hell you want in your gated community. But you need that wall, and you need that army, and you need those people on that wall to basically be the pessimistic people to defend your sorry ass. Okay? Oh, you, uh, so you, you totally buy into that. Hell yeah. Okay, well, there's a believer in all. Hey, okay. uh, uh, because it's not free. Well, that, that's right, freedom it's isn't free. free. Okay, it costs a buck oh five. I mean, listen. So, so. Okay? So if you don't take care of yourself, no one's going to do it for you. That's the bottom line. If you don't take care of yourself, no one's going to do it for you. And one of the big reasons behind that, and again, we're going to talk about this in greater detail, is there was an attempt in the early 20th century at creating the first attempt, the first honest to God effort at collective security. It's an organization that no longer exists. We know it, we've heard about it. What is the name of that organization? 
The League of Nations. Okay? The League of Nations. The League of Nations had all the best intentions out there. And look, the League of Nations does, 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 did, 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 yes, past tense, did have a good number of successes before it resulted in Chamberlain's peace in our time. Okay? The point is, is that that type of collective security can work if and only if those working for it are determined to uphold it. The minute that you switch gears and go from, I'm stuck, I know what, I'm tired of defending the rest of the world, I'm just going to defend myself. Now. The minute that you start thinking about yourself again is the minute we default to realism. The minute we default to this stuff. Alliances are matters for convenience, no different from before. Foreign policy may be evil, but they are necessary evils. So Morgenthau can look at someone like Neville Chamberlain and say, okay, on one level I can see why nobody likes you, but what was Chamberlain's rationale? What was Chamberlain's rationale for throwing Czechoslovakia under the bus? For him. What was the rationale? To avoid getting a global war? Basically to avoid a larger war. And, you know, again, ends justify the means, peace in our time. Effectively, 1938 was their war in 1938. Was there a war in 1938? Yes. No, no there was no war. Yes. 1930, 1939. Or at least in Europe. Oh. In Europe. There was no war. I almost forgot about Asia. For, we keep forgetting about Japan. No? no, there was no war in Europe in 1938. Did Chamberlain achieve his goal? Yes, at the cost of what? A country. Okay? But the important thing is that the British Empire was secure, at least for a few more years. Okay? And if you're thinking about, oh my god, what a dickish move, well then you're going to love E.H. Carr. Wait until you get to him. Power and morality have nothing in common. Okay? Morality would have dragged Great Britain into a conflict with, che with Germany over Czechoslovakia. Power was, okay, take it. Yeah, whatever. You know? Take it and go. A small price to pay to avoid a larger setback. <clears throat> Speaking of power, in this case, Carr is more of a Marxist than a realist. Which some people can say, if you're a Marxist in IR theory, you're just a really, really, really pessimistic realist. You're really upset at that stuff. Okay? But the imposition of one state ideology on another is both dangerous and foolhardy. And why is that? Because a good number of countries put their trust in the League of Nations. They put their trust in the promise and guarantee by other countries that their sovereignty would be defended. And that works if and only if that promise remains. The minute that these countries decide, nah, you're not worth it, guess what? Your security is compromised. So neoclassical realism basically says, don't, don't, don't buy into this stuff. It's not going to help you, because at some point, you will be used as collateral for a larger end. Hence the cynicism that Morgenthau and Carr had weighed towards the League of Nations, and later on Kissinger had weighed towards the United Nations. What's also interesting about neoclassical realism is that their greatest criticism comes not towards the belligerent countries of the non-West, but the Western countries themselves. Neoclassical realism is very, very critical about Western foreign policy of democratic spread. Because they say, that's a toll order to make. Not only that, if you're going to play the morality card, and intervene on behalf of some human rights being violated in one country, well, if you don't want to be seen as hypocritical, you've got to go into all of them. You're going to do one, you're going to do them all. Do you have the money for that? Do you have the resources for that? Oh, you don't? Well, then that's the reason why we stay at home. Okay? Oh, look at poor Kuwait being invaded by Iraq. Somebody should do something about that. Okay? Oh, look at poor Ukraine being invaded by Russia. We'll fuck that. Okay? Oh, look at the poor people in Bosnia being subjected to all of those crimes against humanity. Somebody should do something about that. Oh, what country is that? Rwanda? Eh, well, we remember the Black Hawk Down. Fuck it. Like, if you play that card, guess what? You hypocrite. 
Okay? And you're only going to get scorn from the rest of the world saying, why them and not us? Neoclassical realism is basically saying, look, you're going to run out of money before you, you know, before you try to take over the world. Still, the international system is little more than the national policies of the hegemonic state. Neoclassical realism acknowledges that power and morality do come into play, and that's a really bad thing. Because morality, in this case, is oftentimes linked up with justice. Here's where I want you to really think about this. Morality from the powerful state is linked up to, at that point, justice. In other words, what Carr is saying is that any country that has the upper edge, whether it's Great Britain in the first half of the 20th century, or the United States in the second half of the 20th century, and for most of the 21st century, oftentimes one has the final say on international law and international morality. What's good for the hegemonic country is good for the rest of the world. Therefore, if a country, if another state, has its sovereignty violated, if that state plays into the interests or the geostrategic policies of a larger state, they may be blessed with the benefit of intervention. But if they are peripheral and have little to no value for the major countries, well, then that's just life. Okay? That's just life. I, you're shaking your head, but again, that's why we call it realism in this case. Neoclassical realists are the most depressing out of all. Okay? So we better come up with something a little bit more optimistic. And that's where Kent Waltz comes in in the remaining time that we have. Okay? The neat thing about Ken Waltz is that almost all of his books are standard texts within IR theory. His dissertation, Man, the State, and War, his freaking dissertation, is one of the most important reads in this field overshadowed only by one of his major works, Theory of International Politics. Why is Waltz so important in this case? Because Waltz, more than anyone else before him, provided a far more scientific explanation for the international political system. And he does so first in his dissertation, Man, the State, and War, which then he almost perfects in Theory of International Politics. What does he do? In his dissertation, he breaks the international system down into what he regards as three levels of analysis. The systemic level, the state level, and the individual. In so many words, the first level of analysis, the systemic level, that's the international community. He does not deter from anything that we've been talking about over the past hour. Right? He acknowledges primacy of states. The international system is anarchic. States operate under imperfect information. And alliances can be made, broken, and remade again. All right, so nothing new. But think about it like this. This is a logical flow of ideas. He draws a lot from Machiavelli, whether he knows it or not. And he, notice, he notices that the state, therefore, makes the actions that it does based on rational decisions. If the state knows, or more importantly, state leadership knows, that it is operating under incomplete information, no matter how great their surveillance network happens to be, they still have to err on the side of caution. You've got to remember here, folks, this is reality. The minute you make a wrong decision, you cannot restore to a previous game. Okay, you're playing an Iron Man mode. You screw up. Who wants to be at the helm knowing that they were the ones that reduced the security of their own country? So everything must be done prudently and with a grain of caution. As such, the states make the decisions that they do in the systemic level, not because they're belligerent, not because they're pessimistic, not because they're aggressive, but because they're cautious. And as such, the individual level, the third level of analysis, the one that most people do not regard as important, Waltz puts 
into one of the paramount positions, and that is leadership. Whether they're presidents, or prime ministers, chancellors, wherever they happen to be. We just talked about Obama before. We talked about anybody. Whoever wins the election next year, regardless of what he or she says on the campaign trail, is largely going to be, from what Waltz believes, irrelevant on the international stage. On the international stage, guess what? When you become the head of state of the United States, you automatically have a number of things that you have to do. Number one, you have to maintain close ties with certain countries around the world. Israel, Saudi Arabia, Great Britain, to name three. Now, most people are not going to be all that upset maintaining a good relationship with Great Britain. Israel, <laughs> win some, you lose some. Saudi Arabia, there's nothing good to say about Saudi Arabia. But the one thing that you have to do, keep that government in power. Whether you like it or not. Okay? You have commitments that the state previously made. So what Waltz is basically saying is that the anarchic system of the international arena compels states, and more so their leaders, to act in certain ways. What Waltz is saying is that this is not just simply a vicious cycle of predatory nature. It's unfortunately the best system that we have, and as such, leaders need to make the rational decisions to move cautiously and defensively. Therefore, the actions of certain states compel leaders to act in certain ways. Does Obama really not care about the refugee crisis in Syria? If he had infinite resources at his disposal, would we not be intervening? Or better yet, if there never was an Iraq conflict in 2003, would we be as cash-strapped, military-wise and resource-wise, as we are today, going up against Iran? Or better yet, would Iran even be as belligerent as it is today if it weren't for the removal of Saddam Hussein? The point that Waltz is making is that decisions that state leaders make are not based out of self-interest, but are based out of self-preservation of the state. One's responsibility for the state. And in that case, to finish up, when we look at the world, the world is not only divided by three levels of analysis, international, national, and individual, but by the different relationship of power at any given time. A bipolar system, a multipolar system, and a unipolar system. Just quickly, what is a bipolar system? What we look at? It's like in the Cold War where you've got two major powers. Okay, the international system is dominated by two hegemonic powers that sort of balance each other out, right? The United States, Soviet Union. Uh, prior to that, you had maybe um, Elizabethan England and Ferdinand Spain, or whatever it happened to be. Or back in the day, you had Roman Persia. Okay, two major powers. When there's two powers that are constantly duking it out with each other, if you are in charge of one of those two powers, your decisions are heavily influenced by that power relationship. A multipolar system is what, in that case? What's a multipolar system? It was like uh, late uh, 1800s, early 1900s with like Austria, Hungary, Russia. So how many powers, roughly? Like four or five. About three to five, but that's about it. Yeah. Oh. So anywhere between like three or five. In this case, alliances can be made, broken, remade, whatever it is. Everybody's sort of jockeying for power. Again, if you are a leader of any of those major powers, the decisions that you make to uphold alliance systems and to uphold commitments to lesser powers necessitate and direct one's activity. And finally, and this one rarely happens, but it does every so often, unipolarism. What's unipolarism then? Just by process of elimination. What's unipolarism? One country runs the show. Okay? And here's the best part of that. When was the last time we had a unipolar system? USSR. USSR? Ottoman Empire? Oh, none of you were patriotic here. Like the United States. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
United States since the fall of the USSR? Yes, the United States after the fall of the Soviet Union. Basically from 1992 until, well, 9-11. We ran the show. America, number one. Okay? And even there, it's a dangerous situation to take. But if you're Bill Clinton or any of the Bushes, the decisions that you make to maintain that position on power effectively drives your leadership. So what Waltz is saying is that the international system is not as anarchic as we would like to think. It is somewhat structured. And that structure necessitates and forces, shapes the decisions and the opinions, decisions that we make and the opinions that we have. These theories remain one of the paramount theories of contemporary IR. So much so that neoliberalism and various strands of constructivism begin their arguments within Waltz's level of analysis. This is the closest that we actually have towards, I wouldn't say perfect information, but the most structured understanding of how the international system works today. The nature of the international system, anarchic as it is, forces states to make the decisions that they do. The decisions that states make over time necessarily influence future decisions that new individual leaders will make. You can say whatever you want when you're running for office. When you win that office, you have much more responsibility. There's a backseat driver, and then there's the one with the steering wheel. The backseat driver knows all the shortcuts, knows every rule, knows every trick of the trade. When you're actually driving, you have to take a couple. There's a few things you would like to do. I would love to run that red light. I would love to cut through the gas station. I would love to think that speed limits are really suggestions. For the most part, they kind of are. But it's, you know what? You break those rules at your own risk. The structure, if you hear it, I'll, I'll leave you with this before we leave. If you know that you are driving in a town where the cops constantly ticket you, are you more or less likely to follow the speed limit? More. Do you want to follow that speed limit? Not really. But are you going to? Yes. Okay. So Waltz gives us a lot more to think about than many of the others. That's a good place.